Good morning, my name is Noreen Shah, and I'm the Senior Director of Campaigns at Amnesty International USA. Uh, Amnesty International is a global organization. We're a global movement of about 7 million supporters around the world. Uh, we operate in a lot of different countries, and we're a human rights organization that really looks at human rights issues affecting people all over. We have um, offices in 70 different countries. We have 14 regional offices. You may have heard of Amnesty International. We document human rights abuses. Uh, we report on them to the world. Uh, we advocate with governments all over the world and with the UN. And what we do is try to support people like you to claim your rights um, and to, to feel empowered to bring human rights change yourselves. And I think that that's what this uh, panel is all about, is understanding what are the human rights issues that we're facing with Islamophobia and what can we do about them. So I want to first ask you what you've already been doing. Uh, how many of you here have ever uh, shared something on Facebook about an anti-Muslim, an incident of harassment or discrimination? And how many of you have liked one? or you know, made a little smiley face thing or unhappy face thing on Facebook? A few people. Okay, and how many of you guys have signed a petition online about any issue? Okay, a lot of people have signed petitions. Uh, how many of you have ever made a phone call to an elected official? Okay, a, a few people have made phone calls. Uh, how many of you guys have ever uh, emailed or written a letter to an elected official? Wow, okay, great. How many of you have ever uh, gone and done a visit with your local con congressional officials uh, staff or a mayor or something like that? Okay, so we do, we have some, some seasoned activists here and we also have some people who are very engaged and probably very upset about things that are happening in the country, but they haven't taken those steps. So we've just heard about what sounds to be an amazing campaign in San Francisco in response to Pamela Geller's ads. Um, and I think that we all have seen ads like that in our communities. Um, we all know that these things are happening. And this year has probably been one of the scariest years for me, you know, growing up in this country as a Muslim. I have never seen what, what I've seen this year in terms of the national profile of hate against Muslims and the way it has been um, mainstreamed in our culture. So it seems like we're at this pivotal moment. And what's you know, as scary as President Trump becoming elected and one of his first acts in office being a ban on Muslims entering this country, uh, to the fact that we are hearing about incidents of hate violence documented in, in the CARE Berkeley report, but also just on the news all the time, directed at Muslims or people who are perceived at Muslims, that is probably a combination that could not get more frightening. But what we've also seen at the same time that we, you know, we probably everyone in this room either has been or knows someone who's been harassed or discriminated against or even attacked because of their faith or their perceived identity. We also probably all in this room know somebody who's not Muslim who has taken action on behalf of Muslim civil rights. We all know somebody who's signed a petition or shared an, an article or, or liked one of the articles that we shared or maybe even went to one of the Muslim ban protests and they're not even Muslim. And we all have seen that LGBT groups, Jewish groups, human rights groups like Amnesty International, civil liberties groups like the ACLU, they're all at these protests too. They're all talking about these issues. And as somebody who's been working on these issues for a few years, I can tell you that wasn't always the case. It wasn't always the case that Muslim civil rights were seen as everybody's civil rights. That Muslims' human rights were a human rights issue. It wasn't always the case that people knew that this was happening in your communities. And it wasn't always the case that other people were willing to stand up and say, no, this is horrific. We're not going to let President Trump vilify this entire community. People didn't even necessarily know that it was happening. And some of, sometimes our communities were invisible until they were visible only in a way to be vilified. So we are at this moment where we're both at once witnessing a tremendous surge in anti-Muslim hate and a tremendous surge in human rights activism in support of Muslim communities in this country. That's different than what we're seeing all over the world. I was just in the UK last week speaking to people about anti-Muslim hate, anti -Muslim hate in the UK. And I can tell you what activists were telling me there. It was that when Muslim rights are under attack in the UK, the people who show up 
are not necessarily the human rights community or the LGBT people or the Jewish community there. Muslim civil rights in that country are just a Muslim issue. And so we are actually in a much better position, a much a higher position of power than you may even realize. So what can we do to harness this? Well, first I want to tell you about how Islamophobia, what we are experiencing in terms of anti-Muslim discrimination and harassment in our own lives, uh, it's a huge problem not just because of these individual incidents that happen that we all need to re be responding to and, and exactly um, as has been said that we need to be holding our officials account to account every time something like that happens, we also need to be holding them to account for the national things that are happening in this country. Because never before have we seen anti-Muslim hate so firmly embedded in our government. Never before have the senior officials in the US government been rabidly anti-Muslim and openly anti-Muslim in the way that these officials are. So there's a lot that we need to take on, and I'm going to talk about exactly what's happening at the national level. And then I want to go into specific actions that you can take to combat Islamophobia to, over time, this is a decades-long struggle. We need elected officials who are right now uh, in encountering this issue really for the first time. Maybe they're just a state senator or they're a local mayor. Over time, over the next 20 years, they will become senators in, in the US Congress. And they even be, could become president. And so we need to influence them as well. So first, I want to talk about hate as policy and what's happening right now in the federal government. I'm a lobbyist as well as an advocate generally. And, and I think a lot about what's happening in the White House right now. There are people now in the White House who have built their careers and owe their careers on anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant hate. Uh, people like Michael Anton, who's a White House national security staffer, who wrote an essay arguing that mass immigration has eroded and de-Americanized American communities and said, yes, not all Muslim terrorists are terrorists, blah, blah, blah. Even so, what good has Muslim immigration done for the United States and the American people? So this is the orthodoxy of anti-Muslim hate. Uh, it's firmly embedded in the Trump administration. And that's why we see what we're seeing. It's not just something that we're hearing on Fox News. It's not just campaign rhetoric. It's actually uh, now an issue where if you're a Democrat, you probably oppose anti-Muslim hate. But if you're a Republican, you probably don't say anything about it. So you can compare the fact that uh, recently a letter from all 100 senators in, in the US Senate on um, investigating and responding to attacks on the Jewish American community went to the White House. Every single senator was on it. No single senator thought, I, I can't sign this letter about what's happening to the Jewish American community. Horrific um, attacks on that community in the last few months are happening. But take the same issue, but change the community to the Muslim community. And how many senators are on a letter to the White House about the anti-Muslim hate that's happening around the country? Well, there's not really one letter that's got several of those senators. If you hold a congressional briefing on anti-Muslim hate and you invite senators to them, you're not going to have anywhere near 100 senators. And if you ask members of Congress to oppose a ban on Muslims that has at its premise that if you are from a Muslim-majority country, you are presumptively dangerous, only the Democratic senators are willing to oppose that right now. And so what we have, which is a very dangerous situation from us, is that an situation for all of us is that anti-Muslim hate is seen as partisan. And the more time passes and the more that stays the same and our Republican members of Congress feel like they don't have to represent us, uh, the more dangerous, more vulnerable we will be as you will be as an American Muslim community. So we should make no mistake that anti-Semitism is also on the rise. The, the rise in anti-Muslim hate is not just a rise in anti-Muslim hate. What's happening in this country is a rise in hate of everyone who's considered a foreigner, everyone who's considered an other. So it's no coincidence that while we see the anti-Jewish vandalisms and attacks on the Jewish community, we're also seeing the rise in attacks on the Muslim community. And it's no coincidence that the ban on Muslims coming into this country is also a ban on all refugees coming into this country. Some of those refugees are Muslim. Some of them come from the Congo. Some of them come from China. They're all refugees. But all of us are in this situation. We are all being treated as a foreigner who is inherently dangerous. Anti-Muslim hate is manifesting in itself in lots of different kinds of policies. And if we don't tackle those issues as well, we're going to leave ourselves vulnerable. So at a time when we're witnessing the world's largest refugee crisis since World War II, 61 million people 
61 million people are displaced from their homes. Hundreds of thousands of people are desperate. And this ban on refugees in this country for them is a death sentence. We see the country, this country turning its back on those people. That fight, that fight to say, well, if you're a Syrian refugee child, if you were just a person whose family perished in a chemical attack, you ought to be able to come here and get safety. That's our fight as well. Because the reason why this country is turning its back on refugees is the same reason why Muslims are vulnerable to civil rights violations and to violence. It's because we're all being treated as a dangerous other. And if we want to make sure that this country changes, we have to be holding our elected officials to account for all of it. And it's kind of like racism. You know, there's the racism that a person says to your face, I hate you because you're race. That doesn't happen that often. Anti-Muslim hate is the most acceptable kind of form of, of racism in a way right now, um, possibly in this country. What more often happens is that people just don't look you in the eye, or they don't want to invite you, or they don't want to hire you, and they never actually say what's going on. It's that implicit bias. And that's the same thing that happens in policies. It's not just the policies that typically will only target Muslims. It's all policies that treat Muslims as a threat. And that includes what's happening with refugees. That includes US foreign policy when the US decides to conduct um, uh, extreme vetting of people from countries all over the world. It's no wonder that the spike that we saw, as a, a Georgetown report has pointed out, this first spike in the campaigns that we saw in September 2015, this really horrible anti-Muslim hatred, September 2015, do you, do you guys know what it was happening with refugees at that time? September 2015 was when a photo of a little boy washed up, washed up on a shore in Europe made headlines around the world. A three-year-old boy, a refugee who desperately needed help, whose family needed help, led to so much sympathy around the world for the plight of the refugees. What happened in this country? People like uh, Senator Ted Cruz, people like now President Donald Trump, that's when they decided to start vilifying Muslims on a national stage. That same time, a few weeks after that little boy washed up on that shore, during a town hall in Rochester, New York, a Trump supporter asked Donald Trump, when can we get rid of them in reference to Muslims? And Donald Trump didn't really say anything. So this is no coincidence. This is all happening at the same time. These things build on each other. We are in an era where the US government thinks that it can turn its back on refugees. And that cruelty and inhumanity that we see in those policies is a cruelty and inhumanity that is also turned on us as American Muslims. So what can we do about it? We have to gain influence over our elected officials. It won't happen in three months. It will happen probably over three decades. What we have seen happen in this country since I was a, a child, you know, when people didn't really know about Muslims, way before 9-11, we were in this invisible minority, to what's happened today, the last 15 years since 9-11, we are gonna be living with that for decades in this country. And I probably don't have to tell you that. You're living that yourself right now. When an incident of anti-Muslim hate happens at the local level, we do have to flex our muscles. We do have to show up and campaign. But we also have to build a relationship with our local officials because those local officials in two decades could be president. They could be the members of Congress who are deciding whether or not Muslims should be in internment camps. They could be on a court deciding whether it's lawful to ban Muslims. When there's a possible executive order, they're the ones who are gonna be voting on it. So we're not gonna be always be able to do what we just did on the Muslim ban, which is thousands of protests around the country at airports, getting great media coverage. We have to start small. So we start that, and I wanna lay out these four things to you as things that you, that we are all gonna to have to do more of. We build the partnerships in our communities because we have a tremendous amount of goodwill right now. Because the Muslim community is so vilified, it is also a community that is now being looked at by traditional champions of social justice and human rights as a community that must be supported. So build on that goodwill. When something happens to your mosque or when there's a national policy that impacts Muslims, you're not alone. You have lots of other communities to count on and to say, you better come out and support us. 
So when something happens to that community that you're in or something happens to someone else's community, we all come out together. We're all in solidarity. The second thing is you're gonna, you can work with your local media, and I'll get into how. The third is the local officials, and we've already heard a little bit about doing those kinds of meetings. And the fourth is national officials. I talk to members of Congress and congressional staff all the time who, who don't actually hate Muslims, including Republicans. They don't hate Muslims. They don't want to turn their backs on refugees. They know how uh, the Trump administration's policy, how screwed up it is, to be frank. But when something happens, they don't get phone calls from people like you. They get phone calls from people who hate Muslims, who've never met a Muslim, and who despise Muslims. They only get phone calls telling them to support the worst kinds of things. They don't get meetings in their districts when they go home about this issue of the Muslim ban or of Islamophobia. Most of the time they're getting meetings about health care. That's great. That's really important. But we have to show up. So what do you do first? You can, if something happens in your community and you want to show that it's not just your community that's upset about it, it's lots of different communities, you can organize what we call a statement of solidarity. So it would be a, a, a statement that says, in our town, something happened. A billboard went up about Muslims, and we are really upset about it. And it's not just your local mosque that's upset. It's your local Methodist church and your local Rotary Club. You go out to these different people. You have to make phone calls. You have to cold call these other organizations and say, will you support us? Will you sign this statement of solidarity? So what do you do once you have the statement of solidarity? You make a big deal out of it. You choose a date to go public with the statement of solidarity. You send it to newspapers and to the local radio station, television stations, and say, this thing happened in our community, and we're all standing up to oppose it. We're going to stand up to oppose it on this day. We're going to send this letter to the mayor and demand that he meet with us as a coalition of people who are upset that this is happening in our community. You send that letter to your mayor, and in that letter, you ask for a meeting with your contact information. Uh, you offer to, to meet any time that would be convenient for them. You send that same letter that you sent to the mayor to your state legislators. Right? These are people who barely get any meetings. You talk to anybody who works on state level lobbying, they'll say it's easy because no one ever cares about their state senator or their state representative. Influencing these people is much easier than influencing Donald Trump. So instead of signing a petition to Donald Trump, sign a letter to your local uh, state legislator and that person will actually have to pay more attention to you. And that person, two decades from now, could be the president. So what else can you do after something happens in your community or when you're upset about something happening at a national level? You can ask your elected officials to act. You can call on your mayor or your chief of police to do something. You can say, every time there's an incident of anti-Muslim hate in our schools, when there's bullying, we want you to make a public statement condemning that and, and saying that you will investigate it. So sometimes public officials, they don't want to condemn something. They don't know all the facts. We're not sure what happened. The police are still investigating it. What you can always say is, I want a full investigation, and I want the results of that investigation to be made public. Everyone should know what really happened here. So you can send a letter to your mayor or your local police chief. You can also flood uh, the mayor or the local police with phone calls. So something happens in your community. A child um, is bullied at school and even beaten up, and you want the police to do something about it, but they're not doing anything. At your mosque, you could organize a call-in. You know, Maybe after uh, some prayer service, you can get everybody to stand around. You've all got the phone number, and you all start to call at the same time. This is something we at Amnesty International do all of the time. We just did it for a woman who had a brain tumor, who really needed a surgery, who was in immigration detention, meaning she wasn't actually charged with a crime other than being an immigrant who was trying to be in this country. And we had thousands of people around the country flood the immigration authorities with phone calls on one day. And they eventually had to shut down their phone line. And then they did uh, release her to be able to get a surgery. So this is a kind of common tactic that people use. You don't need a 1,000 phone calls when it's your local official. You need 20 phone calls. If you know 20 people, that can work. So what do you do when you make a phone call like this? You introduce yourself. You say, I'm troubled by what's happening. You describe what's happening. And then you say, I need you to speak out. You're my elected official. I'm holding you to account. You are responsible for what happens in this community, and you must do something about it. And you say, I'm happy to follow up with you. I'm happy to get you more information. You leave your contact information with them. So another thing that you can do, I mean, this is all very scary stuff, honestly. Like, we're not people who think, 
oh, well, I can be politically active and there will be no cost to me. I know lots of people are worried about surveillance. I know lots of people are worried that if they speak out, they become a target for the police. So I'm not saying that it's easy at all. I know my own family, you know, they worry about me doing this kind of stuff and me becoming a target. But one of the things that we can do that maybe feels more protected but is still really public is actually talking to the press. When something happens in your community and you want to tell someone about it, but you don't want yourself to be identified, you can talk to reporters. You can call a newsroom and say, I have information. I can't give you my name, but I have the information. I'm happy to talk to you on background, off the record, anonymously. Just say, I don't want my name used, but this thing happened, and I want you to know that this thing is happening. You know, my, my child's teacher called them this. And they've been calling all the kids in our school who look like this, this name. And I want people to know about it. I can't tell you who I am, but this is what I want you to know. That's one thing that you can do with reporters if something happens to you. What if you do feel like you can go ahead and speak out publicly with your name? Well, when there's an article in your local newspaper about something terrible that happens, you can write a letter to the editor saying that you're calling on your local officials to do X, Y, and Z thing. So all of these, these methods of activism uh, what do they do? They change the way people think about this issue. Um, I can also tell you that as a, a Muslim American person who is very politically active, that one thing that people have told me when they're being candid with me is, we didn't know Muslims could be like you. We didn't know Muslims look like you. Um, some people don't even really believe that I, you know, I come from an American Muslim community. And it's because there's not enough people out there representing ourselves. Uh, there's not enough people on TV who are actually Muslim talking about Muslims. Uh, so it's very hard to dedicate your life to political activism, and that's not what you have to do. But you can speak out. Uh, you don't have to be on TV to do it. You can speak out on Facebook. And instead of it just being an article that you're linking and showing your friends, you're, you're posting that article to your local state. You're finding out who your local state legislator is and posting that article to them. Uh, or you're tweeting at your local le legislator. Or you're tweeting at your mayor. And it's these small steps of activism that are going to change things. And I'm not kidding when I say I think it's going to take three decades. But this community is a minority community. That doesn't mean it has to have no power. We have to have more power because we are in a very, very scary situation. So some of that power will come from working in coalition with people who care about what's happening in this community, in these communities. But some of that power has got to come from people like the people who are in this room, the people who are already taking action. You just got to keep going with it. Uh, know that a lot of people around the world are thinking about you. Uh, that there is solidarity with people all over the world who have struggled who have been abused and vilified because of their identity. Now it is happening to people in this country, and there will be a worldwide movement of support for you. There are people, thousands of people in Brussels, in Newcastle, England, in India, in Venezuela, who have demonstrated against the Muslim ban in this country because they care about what's happening to your community. So you won't be alone when you show up as an activist, and we will be here at Amnesty International to support you as well. Thanks very much.